if you look, take a look at some of the results that we presented here on the right, if you think about the data pass energy and also the accumulation buffer energy and different, I think I'm, my, my figure got, uh, got truncated. But basically the green is the data pass and then we have like accumulation buffer and the weight buffer and the input buffer here. So if you only highlight focusing on either weight stationary or output stationary, you're basically only optimizing one of the, one of the buffers in the system. So still memory access is more dominating than the data pass. And what we really want is to have the data pass dominating the entire energy, meaning that we're doing important thing. And then by using a more multi-level based approach, you're able to actually optimize both and the data pass become more dominating for the entire energy. All right, so this is more like an overview of, of different, different components in our design space. And this is, uh, again, tailored to, to ResNet 50 as a driving example. So what we do is that we take uh, some of the important the parameters, hardware parameter that we observe, uh, vector size, and also different precisions, and also comparing different data flows. Uh, does this work? Okay, anyway, so in general, if you think about data flows, what we find is that the lower, the, the, the rightmost one, the output stationary and lower weight, uh, local weight stationary is actually the most optimal across all the different scenarios. And sometimes it's actually quite, quite significant. We're, we're observing almost like 2x energy efficiency improvement because it's actually being to prioritize, being able to actually capture the reuse for both, uh, both data types here. And vector size, we did eight and 16 and eight. So this is basically the size of the dot product tree, right? How many, uh, how many parallel dot products that we like to do? Um, typically, the wider, the better. Uh, there is a, there's a more like caveat in the sense that if you have wider dot product, you actually fetch your memory less frequently. So you actually, you basically you did memory saving. But then there's likely to be some factorization uh, or corner cases once you cannot support that wider dot product or you actually need to pipeline your Mac unit so you also run into some other cases. So it's not the, always the wider the better, but between eight and 16, you can always finish it in one cycle. 16 is also significantly better than eight. And then precision is, an, I guess, an obvious one, right? The lower precision, the better, and then with today's quantization, uh, four bits is actually pretty achievable with at least the ImageNet data set. So four bits is pretty uh, comfortable from the hardware design point of view as well. Okay, just a quick recap. Uh, so in the design generator project, we are decomposing those components into designers, mapper, and, and tuner. And what we really want to communicate is whether we can consolidate all the different optimization together and provide a more systematic wheel to think about deep learning accelerator design. And also, our results are very compelling because by systematically evaluating all the different alternatives, it actually helps us to find a good design point. Okay, so I'm only going to very briefly talk about some of the ongoing work at Berkeley. We are already a little bit over time. Uh, what I, I think you probably already observed, like the way I like to think a problem, I like to think like what we can do to do things more systematically in terms of design. And one thing really nice with Berkeley is the different expertise that we're actually coming together and think about what kind of hardware or software code design we can explore in those space. Not only just appointed solutions, but also thinking about all the different applications, the system, and also hardware prototypes that we're able to build. There are a range of applications that we're interested in, and especially with the increasing concern with privacy and security, and also another layer of other common software infrastructure we actually need to worry about, need to be aware of in our hardware design process. And as I mentioned earlier in the talk, mapping and compilation is also really important, especially for this regular nested loops infrastructure, uh, like structure, and maybe also for other applications. We, we need to really think about how we can actually take advantage of some of the existing compilation infrastructure, but also factor in a more hardware specific natures into the, into the entire picture. And, uh, 
if you think about today's hardware design, especially code design problem, in a lot of cases, you can really formulate into an optimization problem. So typically, hardware designers are less aware of this kind of different optimization tricks, but we should also expose ourselves in thinking about how we can formulate our problem and take advantage of some of the more systematic way of evaluating those problems in our reasoning of hardware. Again, we are also really interested in the methodology. We have been developing chisel and uh, chisel and furrow based methodology at Berkeley, and also we are also very interested in high level synthesis, as I mentioned earlier, that give you very fast performance feedback iteration and also an easy way for the designers to express their hardware uh, in a more like friendly languages. And then we are also interested in. Hardware prototypes, there are a range of infrastructures that we are developing, and that will be very useful for us to systematically evaluate in our hardware and also provide feedback to our software stack. So with that, I'd like to thank all my collaborators over the past years at Berkeley, NVIDIA, Harvard, IBM, Intel, and the University of Michigan. All of the work that I mentioned uh, earlier are very collaborative work, and none of them are possible without the wonderful support from all the colleagues and uh, friends here. So with that, uh, I'm going to conclude my talk. As I mentioned, domain-specific accelerators are very important in today's talk, and mostly focusing on the scalability and also productivity side. But there are more uh, interesting exploration that we can do across the stack in thinking about hardware software code design and future generations of heterogeneous architecture. With that, I'll end my talk here, and happy to take more questions. Yes, thanks, Sophia. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, the, it was very difficult during the talk to capture the questions, and this is was being recorded, so hopefully we did okay. But if you have any questions, let me know. i give you the microphone to ask. Or any other questions? Yeah. Beta is coming. Um, can you go to slide 25, please? Okay, that's very specific. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll be clicking. I'll probably have you. to lower the expectations. Not going to be a very smart question. Okay, <laughs> good. I actually include uh, the slide number here. <laughs> you said 27 or? 25. 25. Okay. So uh, th the way I read this um, is that like you, you use each chip, uh, each chiplet to implement a segment of the ResNet 50. Like so, that the second convolutional layer, for example, is, on like, is, is being processed on one chiplet and then the third one on another chiplet. Is that how it is? Uh, so, well, so first, this particular result is actually only executing one layer. So it's not like end-to-end -end entire ResNet. So okay. each of the lines is only one layer, right? So whenever we say whether it's one chiplet, two chiplet, yeah. it's basically this layer take one, two, thirty-two, all the different combinations. In a realistic setting, we actually need, really need to run, run ResNet 50 for all the layers. So there are actually different combinations. So sometimes we actually put like multiple layers actually all actually are, are in the same triplets. It just like there will be just storing different ways, uh, different ways, and point them to different basically address of the, our weight buffer so that they can fetch different results, different weights. There. So that will be actually different layer, actually still in the same triplet, well, in the same set of triplets for execution. But there are also cases to enable like pipelining or different kind of parallelism. You actually partition in the sense that some triplet, some some layers are using a subset of the triplets, and then another layer or other layers are using other triplets. So both actually exist in the in the mapping process. Mm -hmm. So so what's the maximum number of layers for let's say like Resident 50 network uh, that you can implement per chip? What's the max number of layers uh, for, oh, I see, per, chip, per chiplet. Yeah. Okay, so our entire storage, basic SRAM size per chiplet is roughly 500, well, I guess 500 kilobytes for weight buffer. So right. it's basically whatever can be fit I into see. the weight buffer size. Yeah. Got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? See. No more? Great. So let's thank Sophia one more time. Sophia, thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of us, we would like to give you this uh, uh, certificate. Well, thank wonderful. You thank you. Thanks again for coming. So mm -hmm. we'll see you next time. <laughs>